Good evening, everyone, again. Uh, welcome to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. My name is Claire Haley, and I'm the Vice President of Public Relations and Programs for Atlanta History Center. It's absolutely my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's author talk. We are so lucky to be joined by Adolph Reed, who will be discussing his book, The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. And he will be in discussion and conversation tonight with Jim Oaks. If you have not yet purchased your copy of the book, you can see all of my marks in here. I highly recommend recommend that you do so. Um, there'll be a link to do that in the chat from Atlanta History Center's museum store. If you live in Atlanta, you can come pick it up from us or we will ship it to you if you're in uh, domestic U.S. shipping. Uh, as Adolf and Jim talk this evening, if you have questions for them, please drop those in the Q&A and we will get to as many of them as we can by the end of the talk. I'm just going to briefly introduce to the two speakers and then turn it over to them because we have a lot to dig into tonight. Adolf Reed Jr. is a political scientist at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of Class Notes, the Jesse Jackson Phenomenon, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Pol an American Political Thought and Stirring in the Jug. He's written articles for many publications, but including the Progressive Black agenda and many others. Um, he's been politically active since the 1960s, has been all over the South and lots of other places in the country, um, all detailed in the book. He is in conversation tonight with James Oakes. Jim is a, a 19th century historian of America. Um, he's written many books as well. Um, he's tackled the history of the United States from the revolution through the Civil War and his early work focused on the South. Um, examining slavery as an economic and social system that shapes Southern life. He is a distinguished professor of history at the City University of New York Graduate Center. Adolph and Jim, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Oh, thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's great to be able to talk for a little while with my old friend Adolph. We've known each other what, going 35 years or so. It's that's, that's right. It's shocking <laughs> to me. To, to, but it's the occasion is your wonderful new book, The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. And, and uh, I, I, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. But the, it's important to know that although uh, although the material of the book is filled with it's filled with fascinating autobiographical detail it's not it's not actually a memoir in in any traditional sense right it's it's right. It's, it's not a personal triumph over adversity story <laughs> it's, it's, you don't present yourself as representative of anything right to, exactly to emphasize you. the various ways in which your experience was distinctive the subject is really the dying of what you call the jim crow order right mm -hmm. So you you bring to that subject a, a certain perspectives that that are helpful and useful, at least fascinating anyway. And one of them is uh, is what you say is the justification for writing the book to begin with. You are part of the last generation to have lived through the Jim Crow order. Why is that important, and what does that allow you to see that uh, you, others might not? Well, yeah, I think it's important for a couple of reasons. I mean, well, well one reason it seemed important at the time I started to work on it is, is that old people always think that way. But, but <laughs> so another one is, is, and frankly, this was the immediate precipitant, right? Because the idea um, emerged from conversations with a couple of friends and colleagues who also had connections to it, and they were both professors. Uh, and, and, and and the sense that a direct connection via lived experience was on the way out uh, right. stood in stark contrast to the ways that both both academics and um, lay people or uh, you know non-academic writers uh, were actually re uh, representing uh, you know Jim Crow uh, and and I mean the Jim Crow order or the South or life in the South between. Uh, say between 1900 and 1970, uh, that that just seemed so out of uh, right. so dissonant from what the social system actually was. Uh, my, uh, 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 my son often uh, refers to the way that people like to think and write about um, that uh, I mean that period as as well as slavery as that it was the equivalent of white people's permanent sadistic camp, right? Like they did it all. Right. Yeah, yeah, well, well, the torture and the brutalized black people. So it's kind of a corrective. Uh, objective. Yeah, but you also you also talk about 
the, the, the specific time in which you experienced this was, you know, the, the cliche is, you know, that the old order was dying and the new was mm -hmm. struggling to be born. And that, that gives you a certain perspective because it exposes the contours of the system in, in which, you know, at the height of its power and significance, you might not see. Right. right. Well, yeah, I think that's right, Jim. And, and, and it's telling too, because, and look, I mean, uh, I think I mentioned uh, but I make this point at least a couple of times in the book as well. Like it, it's only with, with the benefit of hindsight that I could look, look back and yeah. see signs of the unraveling and the decomposition and more to the point that, that, that I could see germinal forms of, of, of what was going or what could become or would become uh, the order that, that, that replaced it. But yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. So one of the basic observations you make and uh, that's critical to understanding your larger purpose is that uh, the Jim Crow order, what we usually think of as Jim Crow, the manifestations of Jim Crow, the segregated schools, segregated theaters, segregated lunch counters, you know, uh, uh, that those were in some sense superficial, mm -hmm. but, but not at all trivial in terms of right. the day-to-day -day experience, and, and that's where your book is, is so moving and, and powerful. Uh, uh, you talk about, you begin by talking about uh, Jim Crow in your neighborhood in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and negotiating just the local codes. Why don't you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, well, well yeah, I mean, um, I like talking about this because, uh, because it helps, helps to underscore um, a way that I it was like really, really stupid for a long, long time. Uh, and, and it's this, that, that, that um, so as in a number of other older Southern cities, which doesn't include Atlanta, but I mean, places like Charleston and probably, I mean, Savannah, Richmond, um, the patterns of racial occupancy by area or neighborhood, um, weren't necessarily strictly segregated, right? Um, and and what made me feel stupid was it was only when I read Thomas Hanchett's book on Charlotte of you know North Carolina from 1900 to 1975 that 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 I realized that neighborhood segregation in the South in, in the Southern cities was first of all the product of the introduction of the idea of the neighborhood as a at, as a distinctive place where one lives as a way of giving a, of making a statement about one's position in the world. And that that didn't come into existence until the early years of the 20th century. It's part of um, uh, the spread of, or, or the birth of, of a real estate industry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, your urban areas in the early 20th century. And the moment at which that real estate industry was born uh, which was precisely the moment of of a consolidation of this new uh, white supremacist order. So, so, so my neighborhood in New Orleans was was an older one, and 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 like a lot of them there is like roughly fifty fifty, uh, black and white, and and, um, and the patterns of separation were also a potpourri, right? Uh, in some portions, it was like. Whites on one side of the street, blacks on the other. Some portions of whites on one half of the block, blacks on the other. And 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 in that context, people kind of had to figure out uh, what what an unofficial etiquette of neighborhood life was going to be like. Uh, right. And and they did right. They worked it out, and, and it was improvised, right? It was like folk uh, you know, development. Uh, but it was also the case that. Uh, when the whites who were sort of friendly, uh, and of course the friendliness is like within boundaries, right? There's no popping into each other's houses for coffee, but 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 often enough, what whites who are very friendly in, in the confines of you know, of the neighborhood would, would stiff you basically if they ran into you in some other context. And at the time, and you know, understandably, it felt like they were being two faced, and in retrospect, they probably were like in some ways, but they were also trying to navigate this system that they didn't have any part in creating either. Uh, right. So. 
So one of the the fact that these codes were local is also an aspect of the system. On the one hand, there is a, a, a kind of legal superstructure to Jim Crow that right. is consolidated in the lab, at the, at the very end of the 19th century. But it also varies from place to place. And that means, right. for example, uh, traveling is oh. fraught. Oh, it was a colossal. Fraught. So you have, ass, you have yeah. two experience, three, actually, the experience of flying and stopping mm -hmm. at a port where, <laughs> right, right. where you don't know which <laughs> restroom is the right restroom or right. sit uh, getting on a trailways bus and wondering Right, you know, sitting in the back because if you stop that when you stopped at Monroe, Louisiana, or something, right. you don't want to get off the bus. Right, or driving with a car and having to stay with friends because you can't stay. In, you know, so right. it's not just about negotiating local codes; it's the not knowing what the codes are from one place to another that makes the system so so irrational and arbitrary. Oh, totally. And, and I mean, I and and, and uh, even at the time in the sixties, like I thought that if you're going to do it, you should do it the way the South Africans did it, where it was the same thing everywhere. Right. Um, right. But, uh, but like, for instance, uh, probably some people like in the audience are going to know this, but in Montgomery, Alabama, and this was one of the immediate precipitants of the bus boycott, but, but, uh, but, but the way that segregation and public transportation was acted out, was practiced. Uh, blacks would, um, get get on the bus at the front, pay the money, get off, and, and then re-enter through the rear door. Um, and often enough, the bus driver pulled off just, just out of spite, right? So one of the initial demands of the Montgomery Improvement Association was to end that practice, right? So they were looking for some parity and dignity uh, within segregation, right? right. Uh, but, but there were all kinds of local variations right 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 right, right I mean, like that and, and and then i mentioned too that um um in commercial culture um you know different uh, well, commercial enterprises were likely to set different rules right. right right so like in new orleans there were some department stores where you could try on hats but not shoes others you could try on shoes but not hats right <clears throat> and then people so uh um uh, uh, um Picked from the buffet of offenses, basically, uh, to 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 uh, to get a menu of the least unpalatable. Right. So, this uh, I thought about two things as I was reading this. One of them is the degree to which the arbitrariness and the irrationality of the system uh, is not is not. I suppose, in some ways, is a symptom of its incompleteness, but in other ways is one of the things that makes it so oppressive. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you don't know. It's, no, that's right. What's so terrifying is that you don't know when you go into the next town whether the rules are the same. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, the airport story. Um, so I was um, flying from Pine Bluff, Arkansas to New Orleans, and I thought that I had a stop in El Dorado, Arkansas. I didn't realize I had to change planes in El Dorado, Arkansas. So we land in El Dorado in the DC-3 from old Trans-Texas Airlines. And I get deposited with my suitcase on the tarmac. So it's 1966. So it's like two years after um, the Public Accommodations Act was passed, which, uh, which means all the signs in places like airports uh, that you know, designated the racially separate waiting rooms had been taken down. Right. But it's a Sunday afternoon. Uh, there's nobody around. I think it was like Palm Sunday or something. Uh, and I kept looking uh, from the tarmac uh, you know, into the terminal for some sign of life so I could read a cue as, as to which door is the appropriate door to enter. And look, it could have been fine, right? It could have been that nobody would, would have cared what, one way or another. But it could have been not fine. And the black person was always expected to know what the rules are, even if they just showed up. Um, so I sat on the tarmac and and I read for two or three hours in a kind of chilly air until my other plane came. Right. But it's also it's also one of those stories where it's the dying old order in the New York. Oh, yeah. Right, right. And you don't know. You're, you're, right. you're, at, you're at this turning point and nobody knows what the rules are going right, to be that's right. yet. Right. That's exactly so, right. Th there are several... Uh, you know, one of the things that I find so so 
powerful about the book is is the humanity of it. That is, you already mentioned that you know you could see your neighbors as two faced because they won't recognize you in downtown the way they would in the neighborhood. But they're also you tell the story of the store owner who mm. you know caught you shoplifting and right. could have made your life miserable in ways right. that could have ended up ended you up at Angola or right. Parchman Farm or something, but instead <laughs> behaved like a humane, decent person in the middle of this brutal system. You know? Oh yeah, and that kind of stuff was was common enough. I mean, this was like either at the very end of 1959 or the very beginning of 1960, uh, which was, you know, what, which, which would have been just a few months of, you know, before the school desegregation controversy um, erupted right across the city. Uh, and I mean, these people were, were decent. I mean, as I say in the book, I mean, my, my, my thought at the time was that they treated me the way that I would expect they would have wanted someone to treat their own kid. Right. And, right. and they gave me the Dutch uncle lecture and, you know, and, 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 and you sent me on along my way. And there were a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of interactions like that. Right. I mean, and, and people tend to forget, I mean, that the, you know, that the segregationist order was imposed on everybody. Right. And, and I'm not saying that most whites fought against it tooth and nail, but, but they had to but, live with yeah, but it didn't emerge from the hearts and souls of the, you know, the white mind or the white community or whatever, but they had to live with it too, just like we did, right? That's right. So was, was the kid who helped you build the model airplane, was that the son of the storekeeper? Uh, that- uh, no, yeah, no, that was the son of the, of, of the storekeeper in my own. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, right. The Galliano family, right? They lived on the corner from us. Uh, they lived next to their their corner store, uh, and they were uh, um, uh, um, so until well after uh, mid century. Like the largest, uh, not nominally white population in the city was Italian, uh, and the two um, neighborhood stores. And like this predates even like the coming of the first a and p right i can remember what when the a and p opened right but a few blocks away and 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 other neighborhood store owners were concerned about the impact of what were the supermarkets uh you know the galliano family uh you know, was right on the corner they were decent people they're friendly enough uh not you know not gruff they treated everybody with with uh, you know, respect and dignity um um uh, I mean, nobody was on a first name basis, you know, with anybody. So my grandparents were, were, were Mr. Mac and Ms. Mac, and, 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 uh, and that they were what I mean, Mr. Tony and Ms. Tony, basically. Uh, and they'd ask about, you know, how families are doing and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, and, and, and this one year, I think I must have been 10 or 11, uh, somebody had given me like a model airplane. And, um, and I was kind of skittish about you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, the gasoline and the wings or, or the motor. Um, so their son, who was uh, probably 15, 16, uh, offered uh, to come, you know, come down to our house and, and go out in the backyard with me and show me how to set the thing up and, and, and fly it. And we spent uh, uh, the better part of an afternoon talking like I would talk to any teenager, right, who, who would ask about school and life and right baseball and so forth and so on and, and and it was just and then right um you know i don't think i ever saw him again but there wasn't wasn't any particular reason to he had his life i had mine and 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 i think he went on actually uh, to be a planner in local government but i'm not sure it's the same guy yeah so it's it's these <clears throat> it's these human interactions in the context of a system that is terrifying you know in, in so many ways that right that you capture so beautifully in the book the thank you the 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 afterlives of the subtitle uh are uh, sometimes political and sometimes psychological Mm -hmm. right so you tell several stories about uh experiences with police while they're driving Mm -hmm. (laughs) that that they're terrifying because because of what Jim Crow was right, and yet they're surprising because they turn out not to be what what could easily have been. Oh man, yeah. I mean, 
uh, the first one, the one that really the, what I'm knocked me for a loop. I was like, and I'm sure a lot of people in Atlanta know this. Uh, yeah, I was on I-65 from uh, Montgomery to Mobile. I was about halfway um, to Mobile, and there was nothing, you know, on the highway. But at that point, it was brand new, um, and and it was late at night, and an Alabama state trooper clocked me breaking down to 83, which was at that point 23 miles over the speed limit. So I. So, so it's just the two of us uh, on the side of the road in the middle of Alabama. And he calls me back to, to his car. I got in. First, he coughs and, and he covers his mouth and, and, and he turns to me and says, excuse me, sir. OK, so I'm already not quite prepared for this. Uh, right. And then he uh, said, look, I tell you what, because I explained to him, you know, I was trying to get to New Orleans. Uh, what, I had to go to a meeting when I couldn't leave. So I got off work. Um, blah, blah, blah. And, and he says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you off with, with a warning. It, um, he said, I wrote you up for under 20 miles or under 15 miles over the speed limit. And, and I'm going to let you off with a warning and just please don't speed anymore in Alabama. Okay. And I thanked him profusely and got back in my car and, and it was really a pleasant and an empathetic um, uh, interaction. The next one was about a year later, I think probably, um, I was driving in South Carolina um, from Greenville to uh, Charleston and was uh, about to get on uh, I-26 from I-276, I think it was, uh, Beltway. And I noticed that a, um, that, that a car had been tracking me for several miles. So I tried, so I made sure I stayed within 10 miles of the speed limit. And as soon as I got onto the ramp, uh, you know, to get on the 26th, uh, the blue light came on. And it was a South Carolina trooper. And he pulls me over uh, and he calls me back to his car. And in South Carolina, they, they actually did mount the shotgun right in the passenger seat, right? So the barrel was well, it was in my face. And, and it turns out I had a, um, uh, the Pan African, uh, uh, the Pan African Liberation Committee had called a boycott of Gulf oil because um, Gulf's, Gulf was invested in uh, in uh, refineries in Cabinda, which is a province of Angola, and they were subsidizing the Portuguese war uh, against uh, the um, what against the anti-colonial movement. And it turned out this trooper wanted me to explain the Gulf boycott to him. And this was also like just after the OPEC uh, right. crisis. Uh, so, I mean, there I was, I was sitting and, and he was uh, quite interested. And I was sitting in his car, staring at the shotgun, uh, trying to explain the, um, what, what this bumper sticker was all about. Right. And he said to me, uh, and, and, um, and, and you're especially concerned because they're doing that to your race of people, right? And I said, yeah. And, and, and then he thanked me and he, uh, but, but he did ask me uh, where I was going to South Carolina, what the nature of my business was. So I told him I was going to Charleston. Uh, and, and that was it, right? I was off. Uh, and he was also pleasant, right? I mean, which was not exactly the kind of interactions I'd had, I'd had with state troopers prior to that. I don't want to make it sound like all well, your interactions were with humane and decent people. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, they weren't. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's so, uh, that's so compelling about your description of riding on the trailways bus is mm -hmm. the context in which the ride took place, right? Uh, in the context of the murders of Schorner, Cheney, and Goodman, right. but also, also at the same time, and much less widely known, the, the bodies of several uh, black right. people had been found floating in the nearby rivers and, and, and things like that. And again, you just never know right. whether or not when the bus pulls into the station, you're going to be safe or not. Right. Well, no, absolutely, man. And, and, and I mean, like I'd compounded it. I'd grown my first beard around the same time. And in that incident, um, uh, we were down. So, so, so it, was, it, it was close to some kind of vacation. Right. Uh, so there were college students who, who had gotten on the bus at different points. Uh, and uh, and there were little groups together. Um, and and we stopped in Lake Village, Arkansas, which is down, down, down in southeast Arkansas. And an elderly white couple got on. And again, this is years after 
segregation in 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 public accommodations, especially interstate travel, um, you know, had been outlawed. Uh, and I don't know if it was a reflex or what, but uh, the, the old couple were infirm, um, and the driver gets up and instructs the two black college students who were sitting right behind his, his seat to get up and let the old white couple sit down. And of course, the students balked. I, I mean, not least because there were plenty of seats after the long, long, long seat they could have taken. And there was a standoff, right, for, pardon me, for several minutes. And I'm in the back of the bus with my pint of cheap vodka and, and uh, sipping and just watching this wondering, right, and what's going to happen? Like, is this going to be when we all get, I mean, disappeared. I'm sure everyone, well, I know everyone was uh, very much aware of Turner, Goodman, and Cheney. It wasn't that far away. It wasn't that l long ago, basically. Um, but eventually, uh, and, and only about a dozen people on a bus at that point, but eventually the bus driver thought, thought better of it for whatever reason, got back in the seat and started driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> I wonder if we can spend, before we go to questions and answers, whether we can spend some time on, on some of the big important themes you develop. You, you, I mentioned earlier that you described these quotidian experiences, superficial manifestations of a much deeper system, right. Jim Crow order. And, and, and I wonder if we can talk, can talk a little bit about what that order was. You have a quote, there are several places in which I could I could have quoted you, but this one comes in the context of your discussion of of, of Floyd McKissick and the Soul City Project. Mm -hmm. You say something like, it, "In one sense, the Jim Crow order was explicitly and definitively about race, and in another sense, it wasn't about race at all." Right. Can you tell us what you mean by that? What the Jim Crow order was? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think of the Jim Crow order as something quite quite historically specific, right? Uh, and it's, it's um, so, so like even take what, I mean, take the big issue of segregation, right? Uh, Charles, Charles Lofgren's work on this is really good, but, but, you know, I, other people have done, done, done quite good work on this too. Segregation didn't become a big hot button issue, like in anybody's mind, black, black or white until Plessy, right? Until the Plessy case. Uh, and and, and uh, from emancipation forward, um, at the state level and at the local level, uh, re regulation or, or racial regulation of, 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 of that sort went in all kinds of different directions, right? So in some cases, trolleys uh, were Jim Crowed and, and, and trains were and, and and ships weren't, I mean, riverboats weren't. In some cases, it was the other way around. In some places, um, segregation was imposed after emancipation and uh, rescinded later and then imposed again. And, and, and in some places that went the other way around. Um, so segregation took on uh, it, its, its, its deep meaning in the context of, of imposition of a codified social order that, that implanted racial hierarchy and white supremacy at the constitutional level, right? Uh, you know, as a cornerstone of, uh, of, of government uh, and, 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 and thereby of economic and social life in every state of, you know, of the former Confederacy, right? Uh, and, but, but it wasn't imposed, first of all, until uh, it it was it 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 emerged right right I don't want to say it was crafted but it emerged as a response to a problem uh, that the dominant planter merchant capitalist class in, in in the South had had since emancipation, which was the danger of busted white people and blacks voting together to challenge uh, the ruling class's absolute prerogative. And for a long time, I thought, well, like, like this must be a, a Freudian concern because the, our, our side, as it were, is never strong enough. But the reality is, um, you know, the readjuster movement in uh, Virginia in 1879 was pretty successful. Um, the Populist uh, and Colored Farmers Alliance in insurgency, like in the early 1890s, was 
dramatic and was successful, especially in North Carolina. Uh, but also along the way, there were gazillions of intermittent local fights over taxation and, 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 and range control, right, or whatever, public works, funding education. And so, and after the defeat of the populist insurrection or insurgency, um, in one state after another, um, first first came disfranchisement. Right, the first move was you know, disfranchising you know, up to ninety percent of the black population, and you know depending on the state you were in, up to a quarter to a third of the white population. So 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 you take the franchise away from these people, and then. Um, you know, the playing field in politics and like thinking about what can even become a political issue gets tilted very, very sharply um, to 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 privilege. I don't like using that noun as a verb, but to uh, um, uh, but to advance the interest of the dominant class. Right. And 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 often enough, like even now, like when people will strain to try to figure out why the union movement is weak in the South and and you get all this crap, right, about American exceptionalism and conservative Southern culture. Well, when the only thing that you need to understand is it is that the working class was effectively disfranchised right, right until after World War II. So the ruling class got to set set all the rules. So there was no like John Altgeld, right, right, right like in the governor's mansion to pardon Right. Uh, the Haymarket rioters, or um, so, uh, so all all public officials were hired hands of the ruling class, and, and not to mention, like not like it was an uh, uh, an open question, right, right until at least uh, I mean, 1964, whether the Democratic Party in the South should be understood as the above ground wing of the KKK, or the KKK should be understood as the underground wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, so. So white supremacy then becomes uh, certainly, as former Governor Charles Acock of North Carolina said in 1904, in in the reflecting on the you know, on the reasons for the putsch in 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 1898 that ousted the duly elected um, po populist populist Republican fusion government, that we needed to have the strength that all comes from thinking alike. Right, and what that meant was that white supremacy, or, right. or the rhetoric of 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 a white supremacy as 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 the sine qua non of politics, was imposed on whites as well as it was on blacks, and it's that period, right? Of, uh, I mean, the period of of imposition to consolidation of of that order and its gradual uh, uh, disintegration after World War II. That that I uh, um, uh, well, um, that that I describe as the Jim Crow era. And in fact, I often say to classes and stuff that was said when I had them uh, that all four of my grandparents were sentient beings. A couple of them probably full adults. By the time that, uh, you know the Jim Crow order consolidated into a normal politics and a normal life, and its back was broken by the time I was eighteen. Right. Right. So 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 it's a finite moment. And, yes, it's historically and, right, and and I want to stress that because people often say, and this happened to me on a couple of podcasts not that long ago, um, that that they have trouble accepting the formulation that the Jim Crow era is over, and it's because we've become so accustomed to thinking about race and injustice in a way that's all about attitudes and doesn't have anything to do with like uh, with with uh, with political institutions, right? So or political or political economy. Right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So when that when that merchant landlord political economy collapses, right. the whole politics changes, right? Well, yeah, totally. And and uh, and and it's not determinist either, right? I mean but I mean like you need um aggressive political forces, you know, to kick in an open door even. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so 
one of the things that uh, we have some more time, so maybe we can discuss your really interesting short chapter on passing as a oh okay as a, yeah as a as a manifestation <laughs> of how historically specific that right. moment in time was from say 1890 to 1940, however you want to date it. Mm -hmm. you no, know, uh, it's really interesting to me the way you describe that. This oh yeah, well thanks. Well yeah, I mean so. Um, Passing is, of course, something I've known all my life because it's just a common enough thing in uh, in, in South Louisiana. Uh, but but I've also been struck for a very long well, long time about you know the overwrought ways that people think about it, right? Um, in novels and movies, but and whatnot. Uh, for for racists like Thomas Dixon, like uh, what this was you know, the horror, but, but, but to be uh, avoided and, 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 and fought at all costs. But for race men and women, uh, passing was a marker. Well, the, uh, um, a common fictional character is the black person, the genteel black person who phenotypically could have passed, but who didn't uh, because of a sense of mission to the race. And of course, the reciprocal of that is that if you do pass, then you're turning your back on your mission to the race, right? But but what I've found and saw and and understand to be true is that a lot of so-called passing was totally um, instrumental and right. flippant, even right. right. Um, um, I mentioned that that on my way to high school, like I saw a guy who who on the road the bus. Uh, and all the black people on the bus were convinced that he was a passant blanc, which is what they call him there. Uh, and he had and he had a job that permitted him to wear a tie and um, and a pocket protector with some pens in it. Right. So he, he was you know, not many black people had such jobs like that. And right. this guy was probably passing to have a, to get access to a job that he couldn't have had access to uh, you know, otherwise. I, well, I knew a family in the seventh ward um, who lived in two two sides of a double house. Uh, they had the same last name. Um, the fathers were first cousins and looked alike. And one side of the house lived as white. The other side, I mean, lived as black. Uh, and like, nobody made any bones about it. And, and there was no angst, right? There's no like... Right. Uh, and I mean, as much as I love the version of Sooner Will Be Done with the Troubles of the World that Mahalia Jackson sings right in the crescendo of the second version of what of 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 an imitation of life, that that moment didn't really happen much. I mean, it might have happened, but in some cases, but that's not you know, passing just wasn't a phenomenon that had all that Sturm und Drang about it. And then when you think about it, um, the, the idea of passing itself presumes a, a regime of strict racial regulation that right. that didn't exist basically after 1970. So, right. so, so, so from that perspective, yeah, I mean, all sorts of individuals for all kinds of what um, all kinds of idiosyncratic reasons want to have an identity other than the identity that that they think they were assigned. But passing as a socially you know, distinctive phenomenon basically ended uh, between 1970 and 1975. Right, right. So <clears throat> this, this, this important point you're making about the historical specificity of the Jim Crow era, mm -hmm. uh, you, you use in your last chapter, you use the controversy of the Confederate monuments in a really right. interesting way to catch like two big transitions. That is the, 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 one is represented by what the explicit message of those Confederate monuments mm -hmm. did right. to distort and whitewash the history of slavery and the Civil War and its relationship to the Civil War. Right. The second thing is the moment at which they are constructed is a moment in which a new order, uh, the Jim Crow order is consolidated. Right. And right. then the moment at which they're torn down reflects yet another order. Right. right. So do you want to, you want to, yeah, I mean, go through those. It's yeah. really 
it's really a, an interesting way to think about those. And I think it's correct. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, yeah, like on the first period, uh, people forget, right, that while the monuments were erected nominally often enough to commemorate the treasonous insurrection by the elites of 11 uh, slave owning states against the constitutional government of the United States of America, uh, some people call it something else somewhere, but I forget what. Uh, but but, uh, but more of a southern independence. Oh, oh yeah, that one. <laughs> hey man, look, I gave a talk at at Winthrop in in, in near Rock Hill about a decade ago, and and it was a big talk uh, with with a packed auditorium. And I forget what the topic of the talk was, but. But in the middle of it, I stopped and read Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution. And, and I apologize. I said, yeah, I know this didn't have anything to do with my talk, but, but I've always dreamed since I was an undergraduate of giving um, a talk to a predominantly white audience someplace in the South and reading Article 1, Section 10 just to bring home that there was no such damn thing as a right to secede from the Union. Uh, but anyway. Uh, but, but the, the monuments, the, the monuments... Try no. to deny that it had anything to do with slavery. And right, it's, that's a lie. It's, right, that's falsehood. Right. Well, oh yeah, totally, totally. And 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 even more telling is that the period in which they were erected, because they were all erected between uh, um, uh, uh, between eighteen eighty and and and, and uh, 1920. Right. They. They were erected not not even to commemorate slavery, so or rather, you know, the lost cause so much, as the lost cause was erected to commemorate um, um, the imposition of the white supremacist order that was imposed after the defeat of of populism, right? So they they weren't so much backward looking um, monuments to past gallantry and and and. And and failed struggle for independence, as they were components of uh, of an effort to to impose an ideological hegemony right. on on whites in in the South to create and impose this this notion of white identity, right? Right. Um, and then they come down when the uh, when that order is, is like swept into the ash bins of history it's gone already for for decades um but it's sort of convenient as it were to um to denounce um the expressions of of of, of inequality that were associated with the jim crow era uh while um uh, but to do so in in a way that focuses on the white supremacist ideology and not the exploitation so you so 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 in the same breath you uh, can denounce um you know, the old order of exploitation and celebrate the new one right because it's right. not racial anymore and that brings us to the the afterlife question right, right. because because uh that that i mean <clears throat> lots of people talked about the importance of them understanding the moment at which the Confederate monuments were put up. They didn't right. have to do with the Civil War as much as they had to do with the, the consolidation of the Jim Crow order. Right. But you use Mitch Landrew and his, his very moving speech on justifying uh, taking down them as, as for some reflections on where we are right now and, and right. what has changed and what has not changed and why why what has not changed causes people to misread the times we live in as right. a continuation rather than a break from the New Deal order. Yeah. Well, the, the, the Jim Crow order. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's really important um, too, because so, so I mean, at the time um, that, that, you know, that the monuments, came came down in New Orleans and and yeah um uh, and I mean Landrew's speech was like beautiful the best thing I've ever read uh and 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 and, and it practically brought tears to my eyes especially seeing quoting Alexander Stevens 
um, speaking of Georgia, but um, but at the same time, uh, New Orleans is like the second most unequal city in in America. The, the poverty rates are high. And I was actually looking at the numbers earlier today for something else I'm writing now. Um, blacks are in substantial disproportion uh, re represented among the populations who get the short end of the stick there. But then blacks are are re represented in in substantial disproportion in the overall population. But 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 at least a third of the white population. Uh, uh, works the same kind of dead end jobs with no benefits, right from paycheck to paycheck, um, and with the same poor public health indicators and so forth and so on. One of the things that's happened is 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 a different system of economic exploitation has emerged, right over you know the intervening century, right, uh, and 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 it's. It appears to be a racial system still, right? Because half a century, well, more than half a century of post-war racial liberalism that has disconnected racial inequality from, you know, from political economy uh, sort of leads us to see what appears to be phenotypic uh, when an overrepresentation of black people among the people who get the short short end of the stick, as as evidence that nothing has changed. At the same time, and and I know Atlanta is as much like this as as New Orleans is. You know, over the last half century, we've seen the emergence of a strong black political and business class that's more or less seemly, or, or more or less seamlessly. Um, in, in, in incorporated or or meshed with, with its white peers. I mean, they live in the same neighborhoods. They go to the same clubs and stores. They consume the same class defining characteristics. They have the same view, view of the world, uh, and they share governance, right? So, it, so, so, so in that sense, in, in uh, and I mean, this is one of the ironies of 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 the Hurricane Katrina moment, right? Because everybody came away from Katrina thinking that it provided uh, um, evidence of how divided, uh, uh, I mean, the city was uh, with respect um, you know, um, to race and, and, uh, and economic condition and opportunity. And ironically, in the more than 15 years since Katrina, uh, you know, the governing class in that city has become more seamlessly more seamlessly interracial than anyone would ever have imagined even a decade prior to that and i suspect something like a lot like that has gone on in in, in atlanta and elsewhere as well yeah so one of the observations you make at the end i, I want to press you on this because i i'm not sure i understand it um mm -hmm. as you say that the the sense people have of, of that nothing has changed Mm -hmm. it, when in fact all of those horrific quotidian experiences have in fact been swept by the boards the, right. you know you, you don't have to worry about you know you don't you're not told to get on the back of the bus and you know right. those kinds of you know you don't have to worry whether you can stop at a motel when you're driving right. stuff like that the, that stuff is gone and the the sense of psychological insecurity mm -hmm. not to mention physical insecurity that comes with it is gone but what has not gone is the class inequality right. that that order represented and was designed to consolidate? Right. Right. This is what this is where I want some. I, I, I'm a little confused because I always thought of of the collapse of the Jim Crow order as a kind of not as dramatic a transition as the collapse of slavery and emancipation mm -hmm. were, but you know a fundamental revolutionary transformation, social, right. nevertheless, the collapse of a particular political economy and a new kind of class structure. So mm -hmm. it's not so much the persistence of a particular class structure, but the persistence of class inequality, right? Right, yeah, right. that's right, yep. Right. right, right. And that causes people to look and say, but correctly, you know, but African-Americans still 
you know, disproportionately lack medical insurance, disproportionately right. have more housing and stuff like that. Um, but uh, 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 one of the things that that is curious to me about and is eerie to me right now is how, notwithstanding that fundamental transformation that I think that I agree with you has happened mm -hmm. is the sudden it's not sudden but the the revival of intense interest in suppressing uh right. the electorate especially right. especially the black right. elite right and and what does that represent to you and, and well look I mean Tories never wanted everybody to vote <laughs> right that's true right? That's true. Uh, 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 right. Because they can count. Right. Uh, and, and and I've said this a lot about uh, you know, disfranchisement in the 19th century. But that if. If if blacks had voted 60, 40 for Democrats. Right. Then white supremacy quite quite likely what would have been imposed. But disfranchisement probably w w probably would not have been. Um, on the top shelf of the mechanisms uh, that right that was employed to to imposing it, and 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 I think the same thing is true now, right? And so oh, that's I why so. I think it's a mistake for us to keep focusing on voter suppression via um, analogy to to eighteen ninety, right? Um, what I was just writing about, uh, um, uh, what's her name, uh, the former governor of South Carolina. Nikki Haley. Yeah, Haley. Um, she, she, in her own own way, believes in racial equality. Right. She appointed Tim Scott to the Senate. She moved expeditiously to take the Confederate flag down right after uh, um, uh, after the Dylan Roof murders. She also is very much in favor of uh, of voter suppression, right? And she gets her ass on her shoulders, if I can say that, um, when people suggest that she wants to suppress black voters, because in her view, she, she wants to suppress Democrats. Yes. Right. And I mean, that's what the key is here. Right. And and race has always functioned as a kind of shorthand that uh, that reads um, class conflicts into nature, class class conflicts and class dynamics like into nature. That's what race does. That's what it emerged to do. That's what it's always done. And it's doing the same thing for the right now that, that it did for the right then. Um, but I should have what I should have thought to send this to you though, because uh, my you know good friend and colleague, uh, prof, uh, prof, Professor Willie Leggett in South Carolina, um, whom who I've worked with for you know on a lot of stuff there, um, called me a few years ago uh, what um, the Ronald Sanders campaign, Ronald first one, and 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 pointed out that he'd been reading V.O. Key's class, classic Southern politics in you know, state and nation, right, and found Key's description of how race worked in South Carolina in 1949, uh, and and found that it works almost verbatim with just a few words changed here for 2018, right, and it works. And the changes have to do mainly w w with the fact that th that systemic in incorporation of of blacks into mainstream politics and into governing means that they use it in the same way whites do, right? To keep um, to, to keep class and political economy off the table, basically. Right. So this this <clears throat> this. Partisan imperative. That's that, mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's not new, right? That in that right. sense, it is it is similar to right. what Morgan Kaiser described in the you know right. as oh, partisan absolutely. imperative. Then it was getting rid of Republicans, right? That's right. right. And now it's getting rid of Democrats, right? And even Van Gogh. I don't know if you've had a chance to read Van Gogh's recent book. No, I haven't yet. No. He also says that the first waves of disfranchisement in in uh, post in the early 19th century North were mm -hmm. similarly driven. Oh yeah, that's right. I've read some of his- imperative. Right, that's right. right. I read some of his drafts, like, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah work in progress. That's right. And it's and, one of the reasons why 
we're misreading the cues. We think it's driven by racism entirely right. by this trans historical racism when it's it's there's a partisan imperative, which means it's about power. It's about right. That's right. And the extent to which we acquiesce in reading the racial cover story as the real story right. does the other side's work for them. Right. Yes. So, I mean, our job as people who believe in justice and equality and whatnot should be to demystify this that this claim instead of trading on it ourselves. I agree. And I think that's one of the things your book does just brilliantly. It's just, well, thank you very much, James. I really appreciate it. We're just about out of time. I don't know whether or not you have anything you'd like to say. No, uh, uh, do we have any questions or? Well, I tried to read the one that was emphasized the, what has changed and what what's uh, consistent. So uh, I, I don't see, some of them are just a little more specific. Uh, I think you did that. Well, let's go 10 minutes over. We'll, we can do more questions and answers. So, sure. so I, I, I certainly have time. Let me see if I can see any questions here. Uh, what do you think Jim Crow wasn't crafted when it came, I can't, came off the heels of reconstruction? Why do you think it wasn't crafted when it came off the heels of Reconstruction? I'm not entirely sure. Huh. This is, uh, you mentioned the book on Plessy, but it's also part of, I mean, I read that in like The Strange Career of Jim Crow, right? It was like, oh was yeah, a period right. of indeterminacy right. and That's right. Morgan Kauser gets more specific about it, right? right. It's right. not, that, that it's not, it, in a sense, it's not until Jim Crow gets hooked it's linked with disfranchisement that it turns mm -hmm. into something right oh and i think that's absolutely right and, and and yeah i think it makes sense right to see the 30 years after emancipation as something like an um um a period of flux or yeah. I, I guess you could call it something like what uh like um uh, i mean the interregnum right but 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 there was it was an open question right uh what the terms were going to be on which the South was reconstructed, on which black citizenship was was consolidated, and especially in uh, in a relation to, to to the dominant plantation economy in the South. And these things just got worked worked through right over time. I mean, it's not yeah, and it's it's, it's you made the point earlier about what was at stake for the merchant landlord merchant class in the late nineteenth century that would cause them suddenly to consolidate around mm -hmm. disfranchisement, but but it, it wasn't just the large questions of, of who's going to pay for schools and who's gonna, right. even down down right at the local level. I remember reading a study that said that, that uh, of lynching that said mm -hmm. that lynchings didn't happen if the sheriff showed up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's when the sheriff didn't show up, that's when you got lynchings. So that and yeah. that matters politically because even if even if a certain portion of your electorate your election depends on the presence of black voters mm -hmm. the sheriff is more likely to show up right 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 when he got some of his votes from black voters right no that's right that's and they're exactly disfranchised right. right you know the disfranchisement and the wave of lynching are simultaneous and they, right. they're connected right right no, racial absolutely. terror racial terror is part of that uh, that system you know um, so let me see if there's anything else uh, when you look at America and the way black people are treated today has it progressed at a rate that you could have predicted did you expect the black community as a whole to be in better social and economic standing than it is today wow well um, that's an interesting question I'll say first of all I'm not the kind of social scientist who makes predictions I predict what's already happened and will explain why it had to happen the way it happened right i'm what but i'm that kind um so i didn't have any predictions and and as my old friend and uh former physician quentin young with whom i end the book said uh once um that um you know he was 80 in 2002 basically uh, but he said in response to a despairing uh I mean, med student that well um, nobody standing in 1950 could have predicted that within 15 years, the back of the Jim Crow system was going to be broken. So, 
Um, and he's definitely right, right about that. Um, I think that it would be good for us to stop thinking about the black community as a whole, right? Because I think that that's, that's, that's basically a class project, right? Uh, I mean, what I just wrote something about the racial wealth gap, for instance, right, on this score, there's a sense. So we know that three fourths of, of the so-called racial wealth gap, uh, and, and in the first place, there's no such thing as black wealth and white wealth. There's wealth that's owned by individuals and households who are black, and as wealth that's owned by individuals and households who are white, if we were to use racial wealth gap as a shorthand for that of your relationship, fine, but that's not how people use it. We know that roughly three fourths of the so-called racial wealth gap lies between the richest 10% of white people and the richest 10% of black people. We know also that the bottom 50% of blacks and whites have no wealth. Uh, now, so, sometimes people who are committed to, to the notion of a racial wealth gap will, will uh, respond to that point by saying, well, but there's collective wealth, but there's no collective black wealth, right? There's no collective white wealth. In fact, the thing I just wrote was, I mean, since we all have, have been conditioned for a hundred years to think of black people as operating with a hive mind right uh, so that we all want the same thing somebody can speak uh, well we can speak for everybody uh, you, you know that point may may not come through clearly enough but 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 say imagine a white nurse who is who who, who has fallen on hard times and and is facing eviction and then imagine the possibility of her trying to dip into the pool of collective White white wealth, but right, to, uh, to pay her landlord or pay her mortgage, or even better, that that she texts um, Jeff Bezos, and 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 asked him to pitch in, but but because they're white together, I mean that doesn't happen. So what so what's going on here is that the whole wealth focus, right, um, is 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 an extrapolation of the mindset of, of, of the investor class right onto all black people, right? Um, right? So making rich black people richer doesn't do anything at, at all good for the rest of us. And in fact, to the extent that it legitimizes the larger patterns of inequality because they are richer, that, then it does bad for, 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 for the rest of us. And as my Colleague Walter Ben Michaels and I have been saying for years now, the problem with this notion of social justice as closing disparities is that because we're in a society that gets more and more unequal uh, across the board, almost on a daily basis, winning disparities would, would mean, or that ideal would mean that the society could be considered just if 1% of the population controlled 95% of the resources, so long as 12% of that 1% was black, 14% was Hispanic, it was half women, et cetera. And that's a notion of social justice that's as legitimate to defend like in a philosophy class as any other, but I'll say it's not the one that I'm committed to. So, and I don't really care about rich people getting rich of whatever color they happen to be. Who was that study was upon one of the Federal Reserve, local Federal Reserve banks that said that if wage rates had been equalized right. in blacks and whites in 1970, the wealth gap wouldn't exist or 90% no, right. of it wouldn't exist. Right. So right, exactly. You know, equalizing so it's, wages it's, right, would be much more important. Much more right. important for the vast majority of poor people, including black people. Right. Here's another but, one. I, I guess I, if we have time, one last question mm -hmm. here because it does raise this question about what's interpretive in terms of race versus other answers okay. suggested this is the question since suggested that one reasons for the health disparities between uh, in the elderly black population compared to the white ones of the same age might be due to the, the chronic stress brought on by years of oppression under jim crow in the medical literature this has sometimes been called weathering do you have any right. thoughts on this? right yeah yeah i mean um 
uh, um, a friend of mine actually uh, has has uh, done a lot of work on the weathering hypothesis. Um, um, a sociologist named 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 Arlene Geronimus. Um, there's probably something to that, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, as a rule, you can um, get rid of most of the difference by controlling for um, income and access to resources, right? But but the same thing about Katrina. Like when everything was, well, when the bodies were actually counted, right? Turns out that 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 blacks and whites died in the storm and were displaced by by, by the storm in numbers that were roughly equivalent to their percentage in in, in the overall population. Um, and what what determined who was who got stuck on the overpasses and in the Superdome, who who got stuck like in in the Astrodome in Houston or like in other shelters, right, in Baton Rouge or or, or like outside the state, who um, you know lived their exile in in, in less um, um, strained or or stressed conditions, who who was able to come back when? Um, the better predictor was always access to resources prior to. Uh, Prior to Katrina making uh, what I mean, landfall, and, and 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 that was true for blacks, blacks and whites. Right. So, yeah, there's something so, to the weathering. I mean, hypothesis. I think there's also a tendency of people like to, um, um, to see the twenty five cent bet on the table and raise it one hundred fifty dollars. Right, 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 right about that kind of thing. A little bit about a little bit like what happened to the statistics on racial disparity in COVID. They, the, oh, the oh, Lord. Went on the more yeah. they disappeared, right? There's... Right, that's right, right. That's exactly right. And by the way, I mean, people are yelling at me and me and Merlin for having pointed that that you know that out at the beginning. But but what's also really disturbing about it is how many people are sort of so infatuated with disparities discourse that especially you know that they didn't think about. Uh, the dangers of what when the sordid history of racial medicine and racial biology that playing fast and loose with biological discussions of of race difference can actually give uh, you, you give aid and comfort to and 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 in fact we've seen it now yeah there's a it it it, it you see it sometimes in in what i think are very dangerous arguments for the Epigenetic transmission right. of tra of the trauma of slavery right. over the course of generations. It's getting awfully close, if not reaching a kind of genetic biological right. determinism that I think anyone concerned about race or racial equality should be resisting, not invoking. Absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's probably it. Uh, thanks, Adolf. Oh, thanks, Great. Jim. Thanks, Claire. Th thanks to everyone in the audience. Thank you so much, Adolf and Jim. Such an interesting conversation. And if you enjoyed tonight's conversation, it might be a slim book, but there's lots packed in it. The South, um, Jim Crow and its Afterlives, uh, available from Atlanta History Center. Um, if you'd like to join us for more conversation tomorrow night on our campus in person, we are hosting a conversation around our exhibit American Democracy on mm -hmm. voting and citizenship. So if you'd like to join that, um, you can find that information on our website. And next week's virtual talk with William Newman is about um, the collapse of Venezuela. So also a very uh, interesting okay. discussion yep. uh, that I think many of you would enjoy this yep. evening. Very good. So Adolf and Jim, thanks again. Thanks to everyone sure. in the audience and have a wonderful rest of the week. Right. Thanks a lot. Take care.